Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, better. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Romans. We'll be reading starting at chapter 11. If you're using the Pew Bible uh, that's in the pew in front of you, we will be on page 946. Again, Romans chapter 11, we'll be reading verses 1 through 14, page 946 in your pew Bible. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they may fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if the trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnified my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Thank you, Steve. Well, I do hope you have your Bible once again open to Romans 11 uh, as we continue to work through this treatise, this amazing um, book of doctrine and theology for us to grow and learn and um, see what the Lord is teaching us through it. I noticed as I was working through it this week that um, it reminded me of working through a master's thesis and a doctoral dissertation that I had to put together footnotes um, at the bat bottom of it. And in college, we suffered through it. I remember thinking back to that, writing a paper. Uh, now, the computer makes it so that it literally will throw footnotes perfectly and get it all set up for you. But there was a day that you'd actually be typing and then wonder if I'm getting close to the bottom of the paper and then time it just right so that it would, uh, and I had to write papers a few times over because I went too far and it just, and so the pain and suffering that the older generation of us that went through, uphill both ways, um, that's what happens. Well, as I thought about this week and what it represents with Palm Sunday, I thought of, um, just starting off with that scene uh, from uh, the movie The Gospel of John, which if, ne if you've never seen it, it actually works through the scripture literally. And so this is the scene of Palm Sunday from that movie. I want you to listen to the, the lines of these the priests Lord, at the end. Come to the Passover festival, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king, riding on a young donkey. His 
disciples did not understand this at the time, but when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him, and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death, had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. So you saw these Pharisees and their response to what was going on with Jesus. They were jealous. They wanted people to respond to them in that way. And jealousy can be a, a great motivation. Um, it can move us, if we're not careful, to bitterness like the Pharisees or it could move us to want something better and to run to Christ. So let's pray, and then we're going to get into this passage together. Father, thank you for another time for us to focus our attention on this solid word of Scripture again that you give us, this rock that we can look to. And on this day that represents your son coming into Jerusalem, this is what is called the triumphal entry. Uh, he fulfilled that prophecy in Zechariah. He is the king. But within a week, within five days, he'd be on a cross. And later, in a tomb. And as we work through this week, I'd ask you to help us to remember just that, ultimately moving toward um, his resurrection next Sunday. Thank you so much for that. So help us as a, as a people that we would seek you, that we would call on your name, that we would look to you. And uh, at this time of the year when some are asking questions, curious about Jesus, that we would provide answers because we've been with him, because we've met with him, because he's changed our lives. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. As we've been working through this, I uh, thought about the amazing group of people that are the Jews. Um, remember, I've told you before, if I was, had opportunity to put together my DNA, there'd be some Jewish blood in it. I want to read you some facts that just floor me about the Jewish people. They are one quarter of one percent of the world population. So get that. They are one quarter of one percent of the population of the world. They are only two percent of the United States population. But listen to this. 8% of all board seats of USA corporations are held by Jews. 173 Jews have won the Nobel Prize. That's 23% of all recipients. 37% of those are the USA representatives recipients, the Jews that have done that. 54% of all world champion chess players are Jews. 35% of all Pulitzer Prize winners are Jews. 36% of Academy Award screenplay writers are Jews. 53% of Academy Award winners for best original songs the lyricists, are Jews. And 37% of the eminent psychologists in the United States of America are Jews. There are, they are a quarter of 1% of the world population. 
I heard a joke said by, I think, either a Jew or an Italian that talked about the fact that when a kid would run out of the house, uh, an Italian kid would run out of the house, um, and their mom would yell, hey, you forgot your lunch. The Jewish kid that would run out of the house, hey, you forgot your books. The, the, this is a group of people that is a special group of people. And there will be people through time that will somehow push that aside. A big reason why um, I believe we are blessed as a country is because we are still in Israel's corner. It, uh, do you realize the enemies that are around them? North and east and south that would love to destroy them. The only reason they aren't on the west is because the Mediterranean Sea is there. They have jets that patrol back and forth constantly. And it only takes about three minutes for the jet to get from one end of Israel to another. It's just a little spot of land. But people hate them. And you and I are called to be people that come alongside them. Not always the nation of Israel. That's what we would see embodied. There are mistakes made but to understand that Genesis 12 still stands those that bless them will be blessed and those that curse them will be cursed and in some places there is a sneaky little anti-semitism that creeps in and even as we look at this passage of scripture it might be tempting to think to ourselves God's done with Israel but I want to say to you he made many, many promises to them. And he didn't lie to them because he didn't lie to us. And if he did lie to them, then maybe he could have lied to us. And I'm so glad that God keeps his promises. And so we've been working through this no man's land of the middle section of Romans 9, 10, and 11. And remember, 9 was that Israel's past and pointed to God's sovereignty. Last week, we talked about Israel's presence, and that showed of God's equity, his true fairness. And now we come to chapter 11, which will take us three weeks to work through, and it's talking about Israel's future and God's integrity, that God keeps his word, that God means what he says. And so we look at this first verse here in chapter 11. Point number one, if you're taking notes in the back of your bulletin, you can do that. Citing himself. Citing himself. Look at, look at with me at verse 1 again that Steve had read to us earlier. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. This, this rejected is, is to thrust away from oneself. So that's the picture there. Has God done this? I mean, all these things that you've been working through in this letter, Paul, it sounds like he's done with Israel. I mean, there's, there seems to be a new plan. And I want you to know that this has always been God's plan. He didn't change things. And we'll see, and what I mentioned earlier about the research paper, is Paul is using this as a research paper throughout. His footnotes are tied to the Old Testament. And so he'll constantly keep bringing up these things so that you and I go, oh, he hasn't veered away from what he's always planned. You do know that he's always had a heart for Gentiles. This summer, we're going to be working through three minor prophets, and one of them is Jonah. And Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh for a few reasons, and one of them was he was flat-out racist. He, he could not stand this group of people called the Assyrians. And if you remember the end of the story, it's, it's, it's a funny kind of thing, but it's kind of sad how... Jonah is responding. He preaches. I know you're like, well, aren't you going to do this this summer? Just stay with me. He preaches. A massive revival happens. 
people get saved, and he's up on a hill frustrated. He's angry. And here's what he said. I knew. This is why I ran away. I knew what you were going to do. I knew that you were merciful and you were going to save these people. And he hated them. And this is the plan of God throughout eternity. That, I'm, that, that when I bless you, Israel, it's to bless the whole world. And so when we come to this book of Romans and a Jew would look at it and go, but, but we wanted this just for ourselves. God is saying, no, it's not just about you. And that is the same for us, by the way. This is a little plug for a second. I've just been so blessed and encouraged by the, the people that have been coming, and it's just a, it's a work of God. But could I encourage you? There might be somebody this week that you could say, hey, would you come? We'll feed you. And then we could spend some time together singing these songs of praise. And we're going to keep working through the book of Romans because actually next week it lines up perfectly. It's going to be talking about the resurrection. So while somebody would come and go, because they don't come to church often, you know, every time I come to church, all you ever talk about is Jesus being born and Jesus rising from the dead. You go, well, if you came for another Sunday or two. And so you have opportunity to not just keep this to yourself, but to invite and, and see what the, the Lord does. So it, he's saying, have they been rejected to thrust away from oneself? And the form of the question in the Greek here, it expects a negative answer. Despite Israel's disobedience, God has not rejected his people. And aren't you glad that's the consistency of God? That's, God is about that. That's, that teaches us something, too. That as you and I, if we are rejected, that we still love. That we still care. And so he says there, look at that, he says, by no means. And this is the strongest form of the negative in Greek. See, Paul is pointing at himself. So he, they would say, you're done with Israel. He goes, no, no, look, I want you to look at me. I'm case number one here. That, that I'm proof that God does not and has not given up on Israel. God saved me. I'm an Israelite. And then, then he, gives, he gives his pedigree. He says, I'm from the smallest tribe. And, and Benjamin, if you remember this back in the day as we keep working through the history of Israel, Benjamin stayed with Judah and did not fall into what the other ten tribes fell into. And so that's what we see here. Point number two, citing history. Look at where he cites history. Verse two, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then he does this, then he's doing the research paper. He says, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? See, God knew that they would rebel and he still promised them what he promised them. And so to back up his claim in that first verse, Paul now points to Scripture to say that that would never happen. And by the way, there's lots of Scripture that affirm this. Even after there's a famous covenant passage of talk about the new covenant, and it's in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. Here's what he says after he gives the covenant. He moves to a promise. Look at this in Jeremiah 31, verse 36. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Verse 7. And this is, how, this is how God wants us to know I'm not done with Israel. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all declares the Lord. He's saying, if you could get out a yardstick and start measuring all of creation in the universe... Or go down in the deepest depths, depths, depths of all the earth and n explore all that? 
then maybe, just maybe, I would forget about Israel. But I'm all in. He picked these, these way out things that you're like, well, that would never happen. Exactly. I will love them forever and always. And he keeps his covenants. He keeps his promises. He can be trusted. And so he moves from that to the promise to Elijah. Look at verses 3 and 4 of chapter 11 here. He said, this is going back to what Elijah was saying. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. You remember this scene, by the way, what was going on? Remember he had just won the day with those prophets of Mount Carmel, like hundreds of them? And he wasn't even scared. He's brave as can be. And then Jezebel starts to chase him. One woman. And some of you are like, this man makes sense. <laughs> I'll keep moving. All right. But Paul goes back, look at verse 4 again. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So Paul goes back to 1 Kings 19, and just work with this story with me. Verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous, there's that word shows up again, for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets. He's whining a little bit with the sword. And I even, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very, je he has to repeat himself, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. You ever feel this way? You're the only one taking a stand? Thrown down your altars. We're, we're the only Christians left. And killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehala, you shall anoint to the, be the prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall put Jehu to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall put Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Things look bad for Israel. Prophets have been slaughtered. Altars toppled. And Elijah's life is threatened by Jezebel. And Elijah is pessimistic. But his view is too narrow. And God's reply is direct. 7,000 still stand. God's purposes are intact even when circumstances seem adverse. And I want to say to you, as you're raising your children today, as you're praying that God would have his will and way in our country, and it seems sometimes you look around and it just seems like the days are dark, I want you to know there is always a remnant of believers. Times that seem the darkest. He said, I only I. He's in the cave, and we can be like this. You watch the news and you just keep that, you just, that just, that's what you feed on. You just take it in, nurture, I'm getting old. You realize, wow, I don't know why I'm so depressed. Could it be that you don't remember 
7,000 that have not bowed the knee. That God is still doing his work and he's been doing a work for years. And is, he's got a plan. And he can be trusted. Be faithful. Keep going. Turn off the news sometimes. Open your Bible and start to see. Go to the end. We kind of win. Actually, he wins. I just want to be a part of his program. Verse 5. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. God didn't choose that remnant because of its foreseen faith or its good works or its spiritual worthiness, or its racial descent. But look at where, how it is. It's a remnant chosen by grace. This is how he's always done this. And he's been reaching into the Gentile world for years that way. Rahab, do you remember her job in Jericho? She was a lady of the evening. Kids, talk to your parents later about what that is, all right? And I could keep going on. Who he picks? He goes, I'm going to pick them. That, that doesn't make sense. You should pick them. You're not in charge. He picks, look at us. We're a mess. And he picked us. He's so gracious, so loving. That's grace. Let's keep going. Verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, this is a great verse, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. This is so logical, so obvious. This remnant doesn't refer to Jewish believers who keep the law. The remnant is made up of those who are saved by grace. He's always been saving by grace. And what is true Israel, what is true of Israel is true for me and it's true for you. If we are saved by grace, then let's continue to walk in grace alone. Rest in his grace. Be floored by his grace, his goodness. He's a gracious God. And he continues to give grace. Verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were, were hardened. And in spite of their intense religious zeal, the Jews of Paul day, Paul's day had failed to obtain God's righteousness because they're trying to do it in their own strength. Remember the, the reason why they, they were stumbling over Jesus? First of all, their pride. You mean my good works isn't enough? And then their prejudice. You mean you're going to include them in this process? There goes the neighborhood. Gentiles, those goyim, those, those dogs. That's us, by the way. I'm, I'm good with that. And so we come here, and they've got this religious zeal, and, and, and why, is it, why aren't they responding to it? This elect, those who God graciously had chosen, in turn sought and found his righteousness. This word hardened, this is a, by a judicial act of God in response to their stubbornness or rebellion. Look at verse 8. As is written, and we see from the book of Isaiah, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, talks about in Corinthians, how even today, as Israel reads they, Moses, that there's like a veil over their eyes. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. So he quotes Isaiah, once again, the research paper. I've got proof from the Old Testament for you. And then David says, 
Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. So that first part of verse 8 is tied to Isaiah and then Deuteronomy. And so he turns to Scripture to explain why he thinks most Jews are not responding favorably to the gospel message. It's a syndrome that goes back to Moses' day and back to Isaiah's day. But then he quotes this. Look at this in verse 9 again. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. I want you with me for a moment. Keep your finger there in Romans. You know that a lot of times I'm throwing the verses up on the screen here, but I want you to see this. I want you to keep your finger there in Romans. I want you to go turn back to the song book of the Bible, the book of Psalms. Go back to Psalm 69. 69. Please do that with me because I want you to see this for yourself. This is what is called a messianic psalm. A psalm that would point to the Messiah. A psalm that will point to the anointed one in the future. It's of David. And so David is not just just under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing a song, but he's also taking on a prophetic role here. He's, he's, He's going to talk about something that's going to be happening in the future. And I want you to look at verse 4, okay? Verse 4 of Psalm 69. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Can you you at all think of somebody that got hated, that didn't do anything that deserved being hated? Can Can you think of somebody? Who is somebody like that? Hmm. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. You ever have anybody that that you can think back that didn't deserve it and there were people lying about him. So we we see that it's foretold that Jesus would be hated. And that's fulfilled if you want to write this and you can look at it later in John 15, 23 through 25. You want to write that down for later. That verse is fulfilled there. Then jump down to verse 9 of 69. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. That first part of the verse 4. For zeal for your house has consumed me. Oh, he talks about that in John 2, 13 through 17, where he, remember, he went into the temple, and um, it starts to, starts to throw some things over because they were turning the temple into a den of thieves as to opposed to a house of prayer. And, and it's quoted here, his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus would be one that um, cleansed the temple. And then the second part of the verse, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And we see that in Romans 15, 3, that's fulfilled. talked about the fact that Jesus would suffer. And then, look what he says in verse 21. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. And that's fulfilled in Matthew 27. They offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And then we see verses 22 and 23, these verses in Romans that we were just looking at. He says, Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Look at verse 22. Let their own table before them become a snare. And so we see that that prophecy is fulfilled in Romans 11. And then lastly, just to finish out this prophetic psalm verse 25 may there can't be a desolation let no one dwell in their tents and that prophecy would be fulfilled in acts 1 15 through 20 peter uses it in his message come come on back to romans 11 i pointed that out to you because that's what happens throughout the old testament If I were to number for you how many prophecies were told about Jesus and how they literally came to pass, 
you would think that most people that would read that go, this is, this is amazing. I, I'm in. See, a person's table was thought to be a place of safety, but the table of the ungodly is a trap. And many people trust in the very things that damn them. Last point, point number three, citing humility. Citing humility. Look at the first part of verse 11. So I ask you, did they stumble in order that they might fall? So after he points at those, those last conditions of the blinded majority, Paul asks if they've stumbled in such a way that their fall is permanent. Have they been shoved down never to stand up? Have they been snared by their ritualism and caught up in their traditions and ceremonies in a way that will never allow them to stand as a nation? Look at the second part of verse. Let me read verse 11 again. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? And he once again says, by no means, the strongest negative. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. This is God's plan. He says, absolutely not. He he says, rather, this falling opened the doors for God to work among the Gentiles, which in turn makes the Jews jealous of the simplicity of our salvation. They should look at us in the church and be just be floored by what God has done. He's not cast them off. Quite the contrary, he says, I'll reach my people by blessing the Gentiles. I've heard about, I had opportunity to go over to Israel back in 99. And if you ever have opportunity to do that, I would encourage you to take that step. It's just fantastic. And we had a guide, and he was a Jewish guide. This is a man that is not a believer, but he knows all of the buttons to push because he knows that he's going to be with a bunch of Christians. He knows the songs. He knows our language. He knows all the different things because this is this makes just how it is. Makes this is their job, but they're not believing in our Messiah. And I've heard of discussions why that's the case. So many times they'll see people that claim Christianity, but they aren't spending time with their wives. They'll see them trying to cut corners in ways that would communicate a bad testimony. I could go on of the different things that are possible because we're sinners. So how do we lead a group of people like that to the Lord? A a good thing to do is, I know this is, be a Christian. Be a real Christian. And if you aren't one, if you're faking it, stop and become a real Christian. Allow him to come into your life and and change your life. Because that is what will make somebody jealous. If they're seeing, oh, why would I want that? You're just as bad as anybody else. You talk a good game. But there's no life change. Verse 12. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If the world's been blessed because of the Jews stumbling, how how much more will the world be blessed when they stand in belief and submission to Jesus Christ? And there will come a day as kingdom is set up and Jesus is king. And all of Israel, the Bible says, all of Israel will be saved. Talks about in Revelation, 144,000 Jewish missionaries. How in the world does that happen? It's because it's a work of God. This will happen in the kingdom when Jesus comes back to call his people of Israel in the face of destruction at the end of the tribulation. Last two verses here. Now I'm speaking to you, Gentiles. So Paul turns. This is the book of Romans. Now I'm speaking to you, Gentiles. 
Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. He says, I'm talking to you Gentiles, not only to explain God's grace to you, but to exploit God's grace through you. That is to provoke my countrymen, the Jews, to jealousy. You see, you might be feeling, man, I'm being used. I don't mind. The people would look at me and they go, I want what you have. And I don't have to fake it. If I'm walking with God, I don't have to fake it. Donald Gray Barnhouse, that preacher from back in the day, he says, there's not much in our churches to provoke any Jew to jealousy because our religion has become like theirs. It's often stagnant and it's comprised of laws and rituals and buildings. God wants us to have a living faith, a faith that as people would look at us, they go, you have something different. So let's have a vibrant testimony seen through an intimate relationship with God. And if you don't have that, ask God for it. I would think that that would be a prayer that God would go, I'll do that. And ask him to make that real in your life. And, and watch how the Lord uses that all around you. Not just with the Jew, but to others who are trying to be good to gain God's favor around us. There's people that are not Jewish, but they're trying to do this Christian life without Christ. Remember last week when I told you that story about that young man that was sleeping there in the doorway? Had been let out of jail. He's on his way walking to Washington. And he stopped because he saw our church and he saw that entryway and took a chance and opened it and he took that carpet, that rug out there and put that upside down over him to keep himself warm. He had just been released from jail for shoplifting. And when we started to talk about Christ on our way to Washington, when I asked him, why should God let you into heaven? He started with a resume, I'm a pretty good guy. He just got out of jail. But we do that. He just got caught. You think about what all of us carry. And the temptation will be to start listing the resume. And I want to get your attention and say, stop it. Because Paul, even as one that was so educated, he goes, I count that as manure. I count it as dung, except for the riches of Christ. So what are you resting in today? I want people to be jealous of me, not because I want them. There's so many things that we go through our life thinking, they'll be jealous of me. Maybe how you look or or what you own, or I could start listing things. You don't necessarily wake up, I'm going to make them jealous. Okay. But there are times where you're like, hey, this, I'm, I've become successful in this thing, whatever it is. That's just temporary. It doesn't matter. Instead, call out to God that you would walk with God. And you will make them jealous without even knowing that you're making them jealous. And that's the best thing. And they're jealous of something eternal. And then maybe, just maybe, it would open up a conversation. Maybe. And then when it's all said and done, even as I testified about the gentlemen that were a part of our men's fraternity group, I didn't make it about them. I said, you know why they're like that? It's because Jesus has changed their life. That's what makes the difference. It's made a difference in my life. Every time I rest in him, trust him, what he can do. If you're you're walking with God, I'm guaranteeing you're having an impact for Christ. You don't have to force it. You don't have to fake it. It's happening. To God be the glory. Let's look to him. Let's trust him. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your goodness and grace. 
Thank you so much for this church family and what you're doing. And I ask you, God, for your glory, that you would continue doing the work that you're doing. We rest in you. We're not smart enough, God. We're not cool. We're not that big of a deal. And you, for whatever reason, looked and said, how much is that doggy in the window? And you received us, us Gentiles and Jews, for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen.